Welcome to another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. I'm your host, Dr. Roddy Ravon, and do we have an episode for you? We have a great episode for you because we are honored and we are lucky to have um, this amazing guest with us. This guest is amazing, not only because she's amazing, but she is a mother of five. That's right, count them, five children, one set of twins. Now, I think that is nothing shy of extraordinary. My wife and I are blessed to have our one son and he's kicking our ass. So anytime I hear of someone having multiples, no less five, a set of twins, I am in awe uh, by your presence. Nevertheless, Veronica, welcome to our show. Awesome. Thank you for having me. So um, we met seven months ago or so. You are currently seven months status post, meaning just post-op, from having an abdominoplasty and repair of your muscles known as DR correction. Remind me, did you have a hernia at the time? Yes, I found out I had an umbilical hernia with that. Got it. Okay. And an umbilical hernia, which is almost guaranteed. If you had said you hadn't, I would have guessed 90% likelihood you would have, and I'll explain why that's almost a given. And you have had, just so the so our listening and viewing audience understands, Tell me a little about yourself. How old you are? How tall you are? How old are you? I am 37. <laughs> awesome. Uh, how tall are you? I'm 5'9". I'm the average height of a man. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. 5'9 is extraordinary. My wife's 5'11". <laughs> and, and and how much did you weigh roughly when you and I originally met? Um, I think I weigh like 210 at Got the it. time. Mm -hmm. Got it. And you have been blessed with five children. Yes. Four pregnancies. Correct. One, one set of twins, correct? Yes. And the age, the the eldest and the youngest, what's the range? Uh, the old, So I have a nine-year-old, seven-year-old, the twins are five, and the youngest is 20 months old. Yeah. So that's nothing, that's just crazy. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And you've been pregnant for, you know, nine years, you know, essentially yeah. constantly. <laughs> all right. And you did it all vaginal, correct? Correct. Yes. No C-sections, no cesarean. No. So then let's talk about when was it that you're like, I got to do something here? Number one, what was it specifically? The emotion, the appear, what was it? It was like, I can't do this no more. And what happened after that? So I want to know that triggering, like, when was it that you were like, was it, oh, after the first one I was like, for sure. What, what was the process like for you? Sure. Yeah. No, thank you for asking. So, um, I've always been really physically fit. I know I say like I was at 210 when I came to you, but I, I lift a lot of weights. I do a lot of strength training. My husband and I, we train together. Oh, I and... remember your husband. He's <laughs> humongous. I remember like, I was like, hey, before we got on, I was like, yeah, remind me. I was like, your husband's huge, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. pretty, yeah. I remember you guys are like bodybuilders. Yeah, he's definitely a bodybuilder. I just, you know, come in and do a little exercise on the side and, um, in between each pregnancy, I worked out literally until I went into labor. Like my second kid, I, I went up, I did the Palm Springs tram hike and was hoping I brought my luggage, was hoping I was going to go into labor at that point. Um, you're, but, you're like you're like deadlifting prior to labor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the way to the end. Yeah. Right. I have videos of it. It's fun. Um, but I actually noticed a big issue like after I had the first. The second one, I started noticing it was a little bit more, my stomach was, you know, didn't rebound as much. But after I had the twins, um, I remember specifically like, okay, my stomach looks this way, but it felt like I had a basketball, mm -hmm. you know, and well, you, you, you literally had two human beings. How, how can may I ask you, how much did your two babies each weigh when you deliver them? So they were born eight weeks early and they were still five, six and five, eight. Yeah. So that's nuts. Those are like full grown babies. All right. Just FYI. <laughs> like, so you carried about, you know, 11 pounds of child. Correct. And remember, yeah. they were probably 20 inches, 19, yeah. 18. Right. I've, so I've had big babies. My first one was nine, uh, 13. Um, the second one was eight, 10. Right. So but, these are huge babies because yeah. you're, you're tall yeah. and your husband is tall. So your body is undergone a tremendous amount. But interestingly, what you have just said is what many, many women say, which is, I did okay till the twins. Yeah. And the twins tend to be a knockout punch. And it makes sense. So That's let's fine. use a rubber band, shall we? A rubber band 
has an elasticity associated with it. And it has a max elasticity that you can pull it to. So you'll pull it, let it go, pull it, let it go, pull it, let it go. When you pull it beyond its max elasticity and then let it go, it doesn't go back to the way it was. You have snapped the inner elasticity that recoils it back. You took it too far. And twins take you too far. They tear things and rip things that would do okay in and of itself if you had had five individual pregnancies. No one's saying that you're going to look like Giselle Gunshin, right? Yeah. You had five pregnancies. But the twins are a significantly greater damage than if you had had them separately because they push you beyond the normal bounds of human elasticity. So definitely that I uh, is is echoed by other women who have had twins. So then yet you had yet another child, right? Yes, yeah, she snuck in uh, three days before my husband's bisectomy. <laughs> She's like, I'm getting in there before the shop is closed. Yes. So we had one more, but actually after the twins, I learned I had diastasis recti. And the reason was because after the time had passed where I can start working out, I had went three months of working out after I was I was approved to do so. And my stomach was still like a basketball, like you push it in and it just popped right out. Right. And right. so that's when I discovered the diastasis recti. Right. So the DR, the diastasis recti, you diagnosed it. How? How did you recognize it? Did you say a doctor? Did you Google it? How, how did that term come into your space? You know, the medical doctor of Google. Um, and I did the, you know, the test, you search it out. And, you know, my husband, he, um, you know, his, his degree is in kinesiology and he knows all about the muscles. So we we did the test of um, laying down flat, putting the, right. the hand in there and pretty much my whole hand fell in. Right. So it was, it was pretty bad. Okay, so so let's stop there because it's important we do these di do these topics. So diastasis recti, DR, what is it? I've done a hundred shows about it, and I'll con mm -hmm. continue to do it because it's a significant condition that affects almost half the world's population. Why I say almost in that half the world's population is female, and almost any woman who has a child, one and or more, will have some degree of it. It is only till it becomes significant that you are like, holy shit, something isn't working right. So what is it? With every pregnant, prior to being pregnant, you're 17 years old, your anatomy is no different than anybody else's anatomy. You have two muscles, one right, one left, the rectus muscles. They're your six pack muscles. Ironically, it's an eight pack. The right side is eight individual, uh, four individual muscles. The left side is four individual muscles. They're connected in the middle and you have your belly button squashed in the middle. They allow you to do sit-ups. When you fire that muscle, it pulls your head to your toes, okay? And then you go and get pregnant, and that pregnancy occurs inside your abdomen, and your uterus expands, and as your uterus expands, it's pushing forward in most women, and it's starting to push on your abdominal wall, the muscles of your belly. And as it does, and depending on how many weeks you go, how much weight you gain, how big the child is, is it moving forward or sideways, is it breech, et cetera, et cetera, the degree of that muscle pulling apart is different, but is some degree. And what holds the two muscles, the left and right together, is some flimsy ass piece of tissue, really nothing sturdy, just shitty tissue. So with your first pregnancy, it pulls apart a little bit. You don't notice it. You go back to exercising. You lose the weight. You look okay. You may look even great. You may look even better. Who knows? But every subsequent pregnancy, those muscles get pulled yet further and further apart. Know this, because it's a big deal. You never grow them back together. This is a fallacy that physical therapists and all these people who are trying to take advantage of women are telling you. The physiology and the exercise that you do postpartum is to strengthen all your muscles together to make your core stronger so it can tolerate the muscle separation. You do not bring them back together. It is a lie. Now, if you have had a lot of pregnancies as you have, and you've had significant pregnancies as twins as you have, then that separation becomes significant. What's significant? Five centimeters, seven centimeters, eight centimeters apart. Then your cylinder your core, your trunk doesn't work right. 
doesn't matter how fit you are, doesn't matter how strong you are, doesn't matter how capable you are, the muscles are not in the right place. They're pulled apart. And so the test you're referring to is a straight leg raise, which is you lay flat on the bed. You put your hands on your side. You don't cheat. You don't use your hands. And you lift your feet off of the bed by about three inches. And what you'll see is something called ridging. You'll see like a camel ridge. The center of your abdomen ridges up. And that tells you that your insides are pushing through because your muscles are sideways. In addition, when you are laying flat and not activated and flaccid and floppy, you put your hand in the middle of your abdomen, you then lift up your feet, and then you move side to side and you can feel the edges of the muscles as you would refer. Mm -hmm. That is called diastasis recti. It is significant. It occurs in almost all women to some degree much greater in twins and much greater with every pregnancy. Why the hell is it relevant? Well, it has two impacts. One, it looks terrible. You look like you're five months pregnant when you're not. Yeah. Doesn't feel good as a woman to people keep asking you if you're pregnant. Uh, right. And the other is it significantly affects your strength of your entire core. And as a result, you have back pain, bladder issues, bowel issues, you have hernias. You have issues with constipation. You have issues with inability to roll out of bed. You have to, you can't sit up. You got to roll. You can't pick up your kids, et cetera. So I go back to you now, Veronica. You were diagnosed by Dr. Google and your kinesiology husband that you have this DR. And what were the signs that you were starting to notice? Because you were pretty fit. Doesn't matter how much you weighed. You were a strong woman. Mm-hmm. You knew that you had a good relationship with your core previously because yeah. you knew what it was supposed to do. You weren't some couch potato. And so now all of a sudden you're like, what the fuck? What happened? happened? Well, you know, you you said that you physical therapist. I went and did every, I did mommy programs. You know, I you, we talk about my husband. I have a personal trainer at home. Not only am I doing my, you know, core at home, I'm dieting really, really hardcore. And then I'm doing these extra mommy tuck programs. And I mean, it's just, you feel so hopeless because it's not going back. Right. So very important. We highlight this. Everyone listening, pay attention. The psychology of this process is very, very defeative, defeatist and hopeless because you're being told by your loved ones, and the community at large online that you just need to diet and exercise. And this will right. fix itself. You yeah, and actually, they- yeah, actually, I was online the other day and some person was online saying, you have DR, do this program. And I'm like, that's right. such bullshit. <laughs> right. So they're telling you that the issue you're having, the reason your belly looks like a bomb went off, the fact mm-hmm. that you're completely feeling like a noodle the fact that you have really no strength and your back hurts yes you may have gained weight that has nothing to do with this you got to lose that weight if you were 170 pounds and then you gained 40 pounds in your pregnancy and you're still 25 pounds overweight neither here nor there we're talking about the muscle part Mm -hmm. there ain't no core strength that you're gonna no exercise on this planet no program online no lying no lying physical therapist slash trainer who's going to fix it now what they can do and what i am all for is strengthening the circumferential abdominal wall as a whole and getting yourself in its max place but do not think for a moment that that thing's going to come back together so the problem is you feel hopeless you said it exactly right you feel oh my god i'm hopeless i trying i'm eating well Shit, I'm exercising. Nothing is looking better. People keep asking me if I'm pregnant. What were some of the symptoms you were having? Uh, Well, so the main reason I went to go get fixed, well, because I just figured, well, I can't do this, right? I'm the main provider at home. My husband stays home with the kids. And I'm just like, it's just costs all that. But I kept actually getting sick. I actually didn't know I had a hernia. Just I just thought your stomach's supposed to look that way. After that many kids. So right. um, I kept getting nauseous. I always felt like I was pregnant, knew I wasn't, but nauseous, couldn't eat. Uh, I just always felt sick. So I actually went to urgent care one day 
And they're like, you have a hernia. This is probably what's causing it. And then I'm like, holy shit, no one told me I ever had a hernia. Right. And I always knew I had the DR, but never the hernia with it. And so, um, yeah, going to someone like you, you point, you just, you saw it. You're like, oh yeah, definitely hernia with it. So people who have significant DR Mm -hmm. almost always have a hernia because it makes sense. The muscles are in the middle of your abdomen. You have your multiple pregnancies, they pull apart. Now you have this shitty little film that we that's holding things together. Technically, it's not a hernia because it's connected, it's just film, but it's very flimsy. That flimsy film is very, very weak and things penetrate through it, like your belly button and hernias come through it all the time. So when your, your di- di- diastasis is quite wide, it's very common for crap to come through the middle. So much so that I find what's called incidental hernias, meaning I go to do the surgery, the patient doesn't know they have it or they don't have it. It's not obvious to the eye. And as I'm going through the surgery, I'm like, oh, there's a hernia. In other words, something is poking through the middle of this wispy tissue. So you decided, I can't do this shit no more. I'm doing this exercise. I'm dieting. I got this nausea. I got this hernia. People are asking me if I'm five months pregnant. So you go online and what, so tell me your journey. How do you figure out what to do? What, I mean, what's the solution? Do you go to a general surgeon? What the hell do I do? Who do I talk yes. to? Well, originally I was just going to get the hernia fixed, right? And knowing um, that if I didn't get my diastasis recti fixed, it most likely would reoccur. And the problem is insurance doesn't cover the DR, right? They only cover the hernia. And me being a busy person, I didn't have time to recover from two surgeries. I would have to do the hernia first, which makes no sense to go open and what, you know, um, re fix the other part. And my actual sister-in-law, so she's, she's a nurse. And so she talked to her doctor friends and they actually recommended you a part of that. So, um, that was cool. They're like, yeah, just open the hood and fix it. That was, I guess that's what doctors say. <laughs> fix right. it all at one time. Like a mechanic, so, right? Yes. <laughs> so I just started looking, I started, you know, your name was mentioned and, and just to be, um, just to make sure I did all my, you know, due diligence, I looked at a bunch of other surgeons, went to some visits and yeah, definitely didn't feel that comfortable with anyone else. So, so we're going to, we're going to dive into that for a second. So okay. what you said is very important for people to understand. If you have a hernia and you're a regular person, you can go see a general surgeon and they'll do whatever they do. If you are a mother who has had multiple pregnancies, has a significant DR and have a hernia in the middle where the DR is located and you go see a general surgeon, you will be screwed. Listen carefully. I'm going to repeat that. Not only is it a bad idea, it's a terrible idea. Why? Because you cannot fix that hernia if the muscles are not brought together. What they do, which is an error is they go in and then they put some kind of mesh or some kind of something on top of the hernia, but it's still on shitty material. The DR, the muscles are far apart. When I do your diastasis repair and I do your tummy tuck and I do your hernia repair, the reason why it's all done in one is because we repair the hernia by pushing it back in And instead of using mesh or plastic or material, we bring the muscles over the hole and recreate the normal physiology without using anything foreign to do it. And that will never recur. Whereas if you stick a piece of plastic over it, it's going to recur 99.9% of times because you're sticking it on flimsy tissue. And so, It's not even about efficiency that you were lucky. Oh, well, I don't want to have to go through it twice. And I'm doing something that you would... It's just not the right surgery for this type of hernia. The only solution for this type of hernia is to do it all at once because you need the DR repaired and you can't fix the DR unless you do it through an abdominal thrust. Yes, I learned that. Okay, so we're going to... You told me that you... You just told me that I actually didn't know. You told me that you went to four four consults. Correct. In addition to me or with me? Uh, with you. Okay, so that's great. 
So you met your 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 doctor's family, whatever. Say, oh, go to Dr. Bond. You're like, good, add him to the list. The right thing to do is make sure that that's the right thing to do. So you go to these other people. Tell me a little about, because I think it's really important. What is it that you heard differently so that people have an understanding of the contrast of information that's being said? Yes. So what were the what were the how what were the differences in the things that you heard? So um, one surgeon didn't even he just looked at me, <laughs> didn't didn't touch me by the way, and was like, "Yeah, you just need to get the hernia fixed and lose weight, and come back." Aha! Uh-huh. So without touching you, correct. So you went in for an exam. And you saw a doctor. You paid a consult fee. You're sitting there. The mm-hmm. guy is a and no checking diastasis, feeling nothing. Okay. Nothing. Awesome. That was a good one. Yeah. The others were, um, you know, kind of another one tried to like sell me like a boob job with it. <laughs> cool. While you're here, we're going to give you the navigation and the sunroof to the <laughs> Okay. Right. Up, you, upsell. Yes. I mean, I've breastfed all my kids, you know, but to me, I'm not insecure about that portion. I'm like, yeah, it's part of it. Um, and the other one seemed okay, but the biggest thing which you did was you, uh, your office provided me um, your podcast plus a bunch of articles, and uh, you also provided me information to ask the doctors, other doctors. Right. So, like, if you don't come with us, that's fine. Just make sure you're asking these questions. So that was very, um, that's what really made me, you know, come this direction. Well, I think the DR, for the most part, is something that all plastic surgeons deal with. Right. Whenever you do an abdominoplasty, it's pretty standard and routine that you're fixing the muscles while you're there. However, I have made it a specialty of mine, an area that I have hyper focused, and I've sort of been on a bandwagon of trying to help advocate for women to figure out why the hell this isn't covered by insurance. So if I have a small groin hernia as a guy, it's insurance covered because the term hernia is a, has a code, mm-hmm. but DR. And you've gone on my gallery. You've seen some of the women that have had DR. I mean, my God, these women are suffering like an unimaginable torture with the amount of separation. And it's not covered because the term isn't covered. So it's an area that I have subspecialized in. And so I think when your DR has become severe, yours was pretty moderate to severe. I think it's super important that the individual have a great comfort with severe or moderately severe DR than just your garden variety one. The other thing I remember telling you was I told you to lose weight. You did it very gently, which was well, very I, nice. I, I appreciate that. I've not been known. For, I have not been known for my gentleness. So I greatly appreciate that you received it that way because I am a highly sensitive individual, but I sometimes feel that it is our job to be a little bit stern with our patients yes, in an effort for them to really understand similar to it is for a parent to be somewhat stern with their child when it comes to their safety. You wouldn't say, Johnny, please don't step off the curb. You're going to get hit by a car. Johnny, get off the curb, right? Because it's a matter of life and death, not eating your Cheerios. So I appreciate that you received it as such because it was intense. Yeah, so well, just to clarify the way you you did it, because I know you see a lot of patients, um, you were touching my stomach and you mentioned like, listen, you look great. I'm not telling you you need to lose weight, but you have fat behind the muscle. And if you don't lose the weight behind the muscle, we can't fix the repair. So it was more of explaining what it was versus like another doctor just said, you need to lose weight. Just saw me and just said, you need to lose weight. So there was no explanation behind it i mean obviously i knew i needed to lose weight but i there was no explanation behind that all right so so we're going to take a quick break and we're going to come back and i'm going to explain to everyone why aside from the obvious like everybody wants to lose weight why you have to lose weight in order to have a great outcome versus it's choice it's up to me if i want or i don't okay Hold on to that thought. We're going to get a quick break. We'll be right back with Plastic Surgery Uncensored. All right, welcome back to the second half of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. We are having a serious dialogue here with Veronica regarding diastasis, regarding the 
abdominoplasty and uh, about the whole process in terms of how it feels, what it was like, the recovery, et cetera. And when we got off the break, we were talking about the idea of losing weight. So yes, losing weight is a great idea. No arguing there. But the reason why it's so critical with abdominoplasties in particular is twofold. One, what we're referring to is what I call visceral fat. Visceral fat is fat that's inside your abdomen. It's called intra-abdominal fat. It's the fat that sits around your organs. It is not the fat on the outside, which you can grab with your hand, which you can liposuction, which you can cut out. This is fat that's in your gut, and we tend to get it when we get extra overweight. Some people carry it more, some people carry it less. But why it's important is that when you push the, when you repair the muscles, when you bring them together, imagine two doors, sliding doors coming together, you're putting stitches in them, right? But as you bring them together, you are pushing like an accordion, the abdomen into itself. So you come in, you stand in front of me. I say, relax. You're like, I'm relaxing. I go, no, you're not. You're tense. Your abdomen is restricted. I want you to relax. And it takes every woman a good five minutes to relax because it's very counterintuitive, very uncomfortable. And eventually I get you to relax and you're like, boom, boom. And now you look like you're five months pregnant because you have that significant DR. Then I put my hand on your abdomen. And this is why if you don't examine someone, you're an idiot. And I push it in as if I'm mimicking your repair. What is the objective cosmetically for you to be flat? That's the cosmetic goal. So I'm trying to see if I, with my hand, I can make your abdomen flat. And when I hit a significant amount of resistance and my own strength cannot flatten you, what does it tell you? It tells you that inside your abdomen, there's too much stuff and you can't just push it away. Could you close a closet door if there's a sofa in there? You can't. You have to get the sofa out and close the door. So when I do that, number one, it will limit the muscle repair. I will not be able to make you snug. And the likelihood of it failing or being protuberant is high. There's a lot of pressure behind there. And second of all, the cosmetic result isn't as good. You, you will not like it. You came for an abdominoplasty for three specific reasons. One, to repair the muscles functionally. Two, to be flat. And three, to get rid of any loose skin that's hanging. Well, if I do this and you're still protuberant and now instead of five months pregnant, you're two months pregnant, I don't really consider that a really great result. So I can't do that unless you lose the weight. That's why I'm dogmatic. You need to help me help you. And so I tell you, gently or not, in your instance, I'm glad that you understood what we were trying to do. And I assumed that you had made some strides and you lost some weight, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Uh, definitely what did you lose how much weight did you lose? Um, I think I lost like clo almost like closer to 30, like 27 pounds. So there's a reason you're on my podcast. There's a reason why you have an incredible result because you did your part. I can't do magic. You have to throw me a goddamn hittable pitch. You have to throw me something that I can clear the fence. If I am selective and I do surgery on the right patient, I should get an absolutely exceptional result. If I don't, it's my doing. But if I operate on a patient who's a bad candidate, overweight, da 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 da, da then we're not going to have a great outcome. We'll have a mediocre outcome. And for some people, that's acceptable, both patient and doctor. Awesome. Good for you. But it isn't for me. And most of the patients who come to me expect a certain outcome. So we sign you up. You went to the other doctors. I, you decided this guy seems legit. You come, we do your surgery. I remember you telling me that one of your main concerns is you're, you seem like a tough woman. I go through the, re the recovery. I say, first thing I tell patients is recovery, pain. Talk about pain right out of the gate. Why do I talk about pain right out of the gate? Because the word on the street, Veronica, the Terrible. word on the street is what? That it's painful. The worst pain ever. The worst <laughs> pain ever. Yes. I yes. am... I am telling you, I have had thousands of patients who come in for abdominoplasties and they're all biting their nails like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't, 
because the word on the street from your girlfriends, the people who did this, mm -hmm. is get ready. This is going to suck ass. Yes. And I've had other friends and coworkers do, you know, mommy makeovers. And yeah, it's been terrible. Right. Okay. So the word on the street comes from people who've had shitty experiences. So here you come and I say to you, the pain is at best average to moderate and it should last about five days. It shouldn't be any greater than a C-section. Should be less. And you say to me, um, I don't buy that bullshit and I didn't have a C-section. Correct. Well, and you, but you were careful. You did say, and I know you probably don't believe you were careful. You did say, this is what I've heard because I'm not a woman. I never had yeah, children, right. but so, you, I, you know, you explained it's about a five or six in labor. Correct. So I said, my experience based on the patients who've undergone it, I haven't undergone it, is that something gets absolutely unbearable. Some think it's, oh my God, this was a joke. And 90% of patients say it wasn't that bad. It was a couple of days and I did fine. So Veronica, drum roll. No pre, I haven't prepped you. No. How was your experience given that you were petrified regarding pain? Um, as far as the pain, I would say that the first pain pill I actually took was at 1 a.m. the next morning because I was stunned. I was like, oh, this is not bad. Holy smokes, this is great. Wow, this guy didn't lie. Okay. He did it. And then- in a few days, would you say would you say that it was unbearable? Was it tolerable? Was it gone quicker than you had anticipated? How did it I go? would say that I I would say only about I mean it felt like a menstrual cramp. I felt okay. you know, like it's helped for hours. It. Yeah, it's burning. You feel like you're burning, like you did a whole bunch of sit ups. It's uncomfortable. Correct. But I I told you it would not be unbearable. I told you it would not be a a, a nail biter, and it wasn't. And that's why we ask you to reiterate that to everybody, because what happens is I have patients who refuse to do this in fear of the pain alone, and they miss out on this great change in their life because of lies that it's going to be unbearable. So that's why it was very important. Then we talk about one week, two week. So for one week, you're a little hunched over, you wear your binder, you have drains. It's not a lot of fun. It's a little annoying. I don't let you shower. The first week is a shitty sucks ass week. You watch some Netflix, yes. correct? Correct. Ten yeah. week. <laughs> Second week, much better. Drains come out. You can shower. You're still not fantastic, but you're standing straight. You can kind of see the forest for the trees. Yeah. Correct? Correct. I tell you, you can go back to work to a regular job at two weeks. What do you do for a living? I'm a professor. Professor. So I say that you can go back on a computer within about 48 hours to 72 hours and send emails and do homework. Was that accurate? Yes, I did about 24 hours. Correct. <laughs> and then when did you actually go and resume work? Um, I resumed work, I want to say, a few weeks later. I Thankfully, I did it over break. So I did it over winter break. But if you had to go back to work at two weeks, it wouldn't have been fun. If you had to, could you have gone for an hour or two or three and set and give a lecture or two. Oh yeah, definitely could have gone for the day. Okay. And then when did I unleash you to go back to your normal life? Go work out, go to the gym, start working out, go be. When was that? Six weeks. And did I pressure you? Were you like, I'm not ready? Or did you generally at six feet, weeks feel like, I feel pretty goddamn good? I was ready to go exactly at six weeks. Uh, actually before, but I played it. You told me wait till six weeks. So I follow your... Okay, so when I give patients recovery instructions, I paint an absolutely realistic picture because I want it to be real. Always there are outliers left and right, but I'm talking about the majority of patients. It is incredibly well tolerated. You are back to school or work within two weeks. You are back to gym and exercising at six weeks. You are back. You're going to feel a million bucks at three to six months. How far out are you now? Um, I, well, I'm about six months past, but I've been working out. Uh, I'm full on with my uh, heavy squats again. So uh, what? I lift everything. What? Everyone says you'll be limited. What have you been limited by as a result of this surgery? Um, uh, you know, maybe that my I don't wear regular shirts anymore. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is full no limit. It's bullshit. Correct. You should not only not be limited, but you should be stronger than you yes. were because you currently have an internal corset 
which is like having an, a, a weight belt on that holds everything together. So you should be a rock star if you do your part. And doing right. your part is exactly that. You gradually and slowly, incrementally, increase your activity level and gain strength and gain confidence and gain strength and gain confidence at your pace. So at six weeks, someone like you who's badass, who has a badass husband, is going in doing deadlifts, squats, all kinds of crazy shit that you couldn't have done even close to before surgery, correct? Correct, yes. Could you could you have deadlift with your a diastasis? Um, it w- I was, but it was uncomfortable. So the pain was coming in. All right. So in conclusion, was this everything you imagined it to be? Yeah, so I would say, well, a couple things. One, one, one thing that I wanted just to quickly point out is that when I went into your office and I saw my stomach for the first time, I had abs. And I was like, oh, yes. holy shit, I haven't had abs forever. And you're, and I made a joke that you probably inserted them, you know, but you're like, no, they've always been there. It's just the like Stacy's uh, kept it from, you know, you can never see it. And um, I would always recommend now, now that I've done this and I've gone through this, uh, for any woman listening, just know that it was really, a, the hardest part for me was the time off, right? You got to figure out, well, who's going to clean your house? Who's going to help you um, with your kids? And for me, it, I had to get everyone on board. And also the hardest part was just sitting. I never yeah. sit. So that drove me insane. But I would, I recommend it for everyone now. I recommend just, you know, get it done. Go with you. <laughs> I don't recommend yeah. it with any doctor, but definitely yeah. with you. We, we love you and we appreciate that. But what your point that you're making is that Without the assistance of this, you can't really resume a high quality of life. I'm assuming your intimacy is improved. I'm assuming your connection with your children is improved. I'm assuming your sense of sex, sexuality and confidence is improved. I'm assuming your joy of exercise and uh, wardrobe is improved. There's an incredible zeal to life when you have a strength and a prayer appearance that feels good. And unfortunately, you know, giving birth is an incredible experience and, you know, comes with that significant sacrifice. But we don't have to do that anymore. This isn't your grandmother's generation where you're like, well, fuck it. You know, I have five beautiful kids, but this is what I had to give up. No, you can have your cake and eat it. You can have your cake and eat it. This We live in an extraordinary time. At any rate, that wraps it up. Oh, one final question. The other thing that people are like, oh, my God, I'm going to have... Frankenstein scar and my husband's never going to look at me and it's going to be halfway up my abdomen and I'm never going to be able to wear sexy undergarments and oh I wear beyond beautiful things it's very minimal and it yeah it's not even noticeable so it's all just listen it can be horrific it can be terrible it can it can but if you do your homework and you find individuals who are skilled, and there are many skilled surgeons, not the majority, but there are still many skilled surgeons through this country, you should absolutely be able to navigate this and move on with your life. It makes me, it brings me great pleasure to have this conversation with you because at the end of the day, the single objective is to betterment someone's life and to see you exponentially do better with your personal, uh, personal life is such a joy especially someone with five children who really deserve to be able to be active and enjoy yourself. So thank you, A, for entrusting me and B, for being on the show. We really appreciate it because I say it all the time, but it just doesn't mean shit unless it comes out of you because yes. it's like, well, how many time checks have you had, Dr. Urban? Oh, it's it. You, you're, you have incentive. You're the one who benefits from it. Y- y- no, no, no. This is the truth. I would tell you if it was terrible or whatnot, but um, it really does make me happy to have you on here because you, um, you know, you can set this the record straight. And it's definitely worth the investment. So definitely. We love it. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Everybody listening, remember my two requirements. Number one, if you know anyone that you think would benefit from any of the information we discuss on the show, you never know who's going to go do surgery. Forward the show to them. Tell them to check it out. Just give it to them. Let them figure it out. And then secondly, You know I always grovel and ask you to go write something nice. It makes everyone who's on the show feel good about their efforts and their time that they put in because they like to hear that we're doing a good job. 
So as always, this wraps up yet another episode of Plastic Surgery Uncensored. Um, until next time, until next week, till next episode, we will talk to you then. This is Dr. Roddy Raban signing off. Thank you, Veronica. Bye.